Vice President, Conference, Emma Rose, Warwickshire, neither first time delegate nor first time speaker. In fact, the first time I ever spoke at annual conference was nine years ago at a fringe meeting. It was Harrogate 2015 and the meeting was called Organising to Win in Schools. I went along to the fringe meeting intending to speak from the floor and share my story of being a rep in my school and how we'd organised and taken collective action about an onerous observation policy and won. However, when I got to the meeting, I was given a seat at the front of the, by the organiser of the meeting, Alex Kenny, alongside a rep from Redbridge, Venda Premkumar, a rep from East Riding, Damien Walenta, Christina Mayall from the Chicago Teachers Union, who spoke about how they built an organising union, and a man some of you might recognise, the chair of the meeting, Kevin Courtney. I hadn't intended to be at the front speaking. I didn't really want to be the one at the front speaking, and I was quite nervous to be the one at the front speaking. But if sharing my story of what we'd done at my school helped, encouraged, or inspired others to organize in their workplaces and win, then I thought I would take the opportunity. This is a theme I'll be coming back to. But before I go any further with that, Seeing as we're going to be spending the next three and a half days together, I thought I'd tell you a bit about myself. So I'm Emma Rose, a daughter, a mother, a sister, an auntie, a friend, a comrade, a teacher, an educator, an activist, a trade unionist. I've been at meetings before when people have been asked to share their story of how they got involved and active in their trade union. Often people say that politics was something that they'd been born into and always grown up with. They were on demos and picket lines in their push chairs. But this wasn't my experience. My dad was a draftsman. My mum worked different jobs to fit in around being there for me and my sister. Night shifts in the kitchen at the Little Chef on the A46. Saturdays in the Little Woods Cafe or as a dinner lady at the school we attended. Neither of them was hugely political, but one thing my dad did give me was the gift of supporting Coventry City. <laughs> Anyone who's followed the fortunes of Coventry City over the years will understand me when I say that it hasn't always felt like a gift. <laughs> but it was on the terraces of Highfield Road where I'd stand with my dad on Saturday afternoons that I developed my sense of the collective. A line in the sky blue song goes, while we sing together, we will never lose. And I could never really figure that out because it felt like we were singing together, yet we still lost <laughs> on many occasions. But actually, when I thought about it, it was precisely the singing together, the being part of something wider than just ourselves, the coming together to strengthen the collective that defined what winning really is. And that spirit is something that remains with me and drives me every day. From my mum, I inherited a strong desire always to be the last one on the dance floor at the end of the night. <laughs> But also, I'm incredibly grateful that she gave me the freedom and encouraged me to do the things that made me feel happy and fulfilled. I feel immensely lucky to have been able to go to university without having to pay tuition fees. As the first one in my family to go to university, however, I'm honestly not sure I would have gone if I'd had to pay and start my working life with the level of debt that today's students are burdened with. I had no idea where studying for a degree in French and German would lead me, but I knew that I loved studying languages, and I knew that this was a path I wanted to pursue. The problem with pursuing a path, not knowing where it'll lead, however, is that eventually it comes to an end, 
and you have to choose your next direction. I remember in my final year of university going to a fancy hotel in Bath for a milk round event, armed with my CV to hear all about the graduate opportunities with Price Waterhouse Cooper. I left with my CV stuffed firmly into my bag, knowing that even if I wasn't sure of much in life, one thing I was sure of was that I didn't want to spend my life in pursuit of creating wealth. As the famous Nelson Mandela quote says, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. And that's essentially why I became a teacher, because my ambition was, and still is, to change the world. So I became a teacher, and my first job was at Daventry William Parker School in Northamptonshire, where I was fortunate to work with a wonderful head of department, Marilyn Edwards, and my NQT mentor, Sharon Holiday. I'm so grateful to have had this start to my teaching career. It was, it was a place where in everything we did, the students came first. We wanted the best for them. And as an NQT, I was encouraged to be creative and innovative in pursuit of those aims. I never once heard the words, that's not how we do things here. Instead, we asked ourselves constantly, how can we do things differently? And how might we change things for the better? It was here that I learned in education never to accept the status quo and to continually question how things would look if we had autonomy as educators, to create a system in which our students were valued as individuals and where they could genuinely thrive and have their achievements recognised. The desire to create this kind of system is what motivates me to this day and every day. From here, I moved to Trinity Catholic School, where I stayed for 13 years. As teachers, the students called us by our first names, which I loved. Peter Hastings, who founded the school, was, according to his obituary, a visionary Catholic headteacher who championed children's rights to learn in a free atmosphere and encouraged their curiosity. He had the ethos that we are all equal in God's image and God calls us by our name. Therefore, we should all call each other by our names. I don't have a belief in God, but I do share the belief and impressed on my students that we were equals. I started each school year with my new classes by telling the students that I probably knew more French and German than they did, but that didn't make me better than them and that we should respect each other, not because I was Mrs. Moore, their teacher, but because we shared a humanity, and within that we all had an intrinsic value and deserved to be treated with dignity. It was here that I really developed my understanding that I don't just teach French and German, I teach children. And when we talk as a union about no child being left behind, we have to mean it and advocate on behalf of the children who are not only being failed by this government, but also being failed by the education system. It was also at Trinity Catholic School that I became school rep and active in the union for the first time. A bit like speaking at that fringe meeting nine years ago, I hadn't intended to become the rep. I didn't necessarily want to be the rep. I was quite nervous about becoming the rep. But when the head said in briefing one morning that there were redundancies coming up and so he needed to meet with the union reps and that ATL and NASUWT had reps but the NUT didn't, I stepped forward. Well, actually, I think everyone else stepped back and left me at the front. <laughs> But anyway, I found myself at the front and found myself in the role of rep. It's often said that the workplace rep is the most important role in the union, and that's because it's true. As Warwickshire secretary, a rep once asked me to go in to support her and a group of members who were in dispute over their observation policy. The rep said at the members' meeting I attended that she'd spoken to the head and he'd refused to back down, 
so now she was bringing the union in. I said that I wasn't the union, the people in the room were the union. I could advise, support and stand alongside them, but the union was right there in that room. The members, organised and led by the rep, just needed to realise that for themselves and claim that collective power, which they did, and they won. And that was thanks to that rep and the fact that she was prepared to be the voice for and of the members. Being the rep isn't always an easy place to be, though. When we had a new head arrive at my school, I introduced myself to him as the rep, and he replied with the words that unions were anathema to him. He said he couldn't stand the idea of us sitting in a room and complaining. I told him he'd got it all wrong, that people were unhappy anyway, and when we had a union meeting, we were coming together to find solutions and make things better. I likened it to a doctor giving you a diagnosis. They haven't caused the illness, and you really ought to listen to them as they'll be the ones to advise you on a cure. Unfortunately, he never did listen to us, but we organised, we fought back, and on every single issue, we won. We won by refusing to take part in a mock Ofsted. We won by saying no to GCSE teachers being told they had to cover in their game time. We won by stopping a restructure whereby support staff were being made redundant. We won by collectivising around a member who had been put on an informal support plan which we considered to be discriminatory. We won by saying no to database performance management targets. On every single issue that we fought on, we won. The last dispute was arguably the most significant. This was about the right for us to determine how we need and want to develop as teachers, rather than have that imposed on us. Sadly, this lack of professional autonomy is something that is becoming ever more prevalent in our education system. I've heard of schools where there are prescribed schemes of learning that are determined by the mat. Scripted lesson plans written by people who don't know the students in the classroom. Classrooms where students aren't allowed to ask questions. All of these damage a school and an educator's capacity to relate to the experiences and needs of their communities. And it undermines a student's right to access a broad and balanced curriculum. I'm glad that as a union we oppose the creation of Oak Academy a national curriculum body that has been given government funding of more than £43 million over three years, on the grounds that it's part of a trend in England towards centralised control of curriculum and pedagogy. Being told what to teach and how to teach isn't why I became a teacher. This isn't the kind of education I want to work in, and I think we and our students deserve better. Curriculum, pedagogy, assessment, these should all be trade union issues. As a district secretary, I've noticed that if my members were told, for example, that the lunch break was being shortened or their TLRs were being taken away, they would email me straight away. But if they're told their lesson resources must look a certain way or they have to adopt the new map-produced teaching booklets, they don't think of that as a trade union issue as such but we should be pushing back on things like this. As educators, we're highly trained professionals learning and developing our experience all the time. But for too long now, the current government and previous ones have facilitated a culture of low trust and respect for our expertise. So we must be the ones to get out there and continue to champion the excellent practice that exists in every single one of our classrooms, day in and day out. We must continue to facilitate conversations in workplaces about what is taught, how it's taught, and how it's assessed. 
We must not accept being told that there is only one way of teaching which is right for all, because the evidence says so. In order to properly value education in this country, we must value our educators and empower them to demonstrate their professional expertise. I'm proud that we're at the forefront of the debate on pay and workload, and I'm proud of what we achieved last year. Our, histor our historic strike action has shown what we can achieve as a union. Beating the ballot thresholds, designed to make it virtually impossible for us to strike, led to us becoming more organised and galvanised than ever before. Our membership has grown. We have more reps, and many of our members are now much more aware of the power of the union. Over this last year, our members have been taking action in every region and Wales, and we are winning. We have won on TPS at the United Learning Independent Schools. We've won on TPS at Haberdasher's Girls and Boys School in Hertfordshire. Yes, I think they deserve a, a woo as well. <laughs> We won on TPS at the King's School in Macclesfield, at Malvern St James in Worcestershire and Birkenhead School in Merseyside. We've won on workload at King Edward Grammar School in Lincolnshire. We've won on multiple workplace issues at the Burwell Academy in Nottingham. We've won on health and safety issues at the Caldicott School in Monmouthshire, Wales. We've won on contracts for teachers at Canary Wharf College in Tower Hamlets. We've won on support staff restructure and redundancies at Lion Park Primary in Brent. We've won against academisation at Castlewood School in Coventry. Our teacher members in Northern Ireland have won a three-year pay offer after taking action over 18 months alongside other teaching and public sector unions. And our teacher members in Jersey won a much improved three-year pay deal after taking action also. So as a union, we're fighting and we're winning. But as well as being a union that wins on our pay, terms and conditions, I'm also proud that we are truly an education union, standing up for the rights of educators to express their expertise in the classroom. And we must continue to keep education at the heart of everything we do. Because the reality for far too many of us at the moment is that we simply can't be the educators we want to be in the current system. We're the ones having to teach a curriculum that isn't fit for purpose, that's rigid, inflexible, dull and uninspiring, and in which far too many of our children don't see themselves represented. We're the ones who see the impact that toxic testing has on our children. We're the ones who see a student have a bad day in an exam and end up with an unfair grade, which is far below what they would normally demonstrate in class. It was said during the pandemic that tags and CAGs inflated students' grades. But what if those teacher assessments actually gave a fair reflection of what our students are capable of and exams deflate their potential? My daughter was in the cohort of students who were in year 11 in March 2020 when we went into lockdown and I remember going to school with her on results day. She said she felt like the grades weren't hers, as she hadn't sat any exams. But I told her that the grades were even more hers, as they were awarded to her by the people who know her best, her teachers. We are the ones advocating for better support for our children and young people with SEND, yet we're seeing the services around education to support these students. In fact, all students collapse. We're the ones who see far too many of our students feel like failures because they don't fit into age related expectations or the narrow model of what the education system measures and deems to be successful. I want to tell you a story of a student I used to teach. Let's call him Henry. Henry would always turn up to my lessons with something he'd created in the previous lesson. A pen that he'd turned into a propeller, or a piece of paper that he'd intricately folded into a dinosaur. 
He would happily sit and talk to me about whatever topic we were studying while busy with making his next creation. But writing wasn't his strength. The chances of him passing, getting a grade four in English were slim. One afternoon, I got to a staff meeting to discuss student intervention. And on each table was the name of a student that we had to discuss. The student on my table was Henry. And the question was, how can we change Henry into the kind of student he needs to be to pass his exams? And a conversation ensued about what he needed to do in order to be successful, as he was in currently in danger of failing. I said that we were asking the wrong question. The question should have been, how can we change the system so that rather than feel like a failure, Henry is recognised and celebrated for the creative, inventive, brilliant person that he is. And this is the question we must be continually asking ourselves. Because it isn't students like Henry that are the problem. The problem is a system that makes students like Henry feel like failures. As a secondary school teacher, I see the damage that Michael Gove's world-class education system does to our children. We have a system with failure baked into it, starting with the phonics screening check, where six-year-old children, who in other countries wouldn't even have started school yet, are classified as not meeting the expected standard. I set up a German exchange at my school, and the teacher who came over with the students was intrigued by the idea of four-year-olds in formal education. So I arranged for him to go and visit a reception class, and on his return, he commented that the teacher was lovely, and the atmosphere was very nurturing, but he asked, why are we making children do things that they're not developmentally ready for? And this is the question we should all be asking. And this failure extends up to GCSEs, where regardless of how well you do, the grade you come out with is based on how well you perform compared to your peers. But a bit like Gove wanting all children to be above average, doing better than everyone else, just isn't possible for all our children. So some of our young people are destined to fail, but we don't acknowledge this. We tell them that if they work hard, they'll be rewarded. But this fundamentally isn't true for the system we work in. No matter how hard they work, no matter how much effort they put in, no matter what other amazing qualities they may have that can't be tracked on a spreadsheet, some of our children will be classed as failures. I'm not okay with working at kind of system conference. I don't think any of us should be. It's not overstating it to say that we, NEU members, have played a key role in shaping the political narrative on assessment in recent years. All parties, including backbenchers and peers of even the governing party, now agree that our assessment system is broken. It's also true to say, however, that we are the ones with the vision for how it could be better. One of the best initiatives I've been involved in within the union is the Secondary Assessment Working Party. It's honestly been like coming up for air to be with a group of people who have come together to visualise and verbalise what the alternative to GCSEs could look like and I'm so excited that at this conference, a report is being launched which collates case studies gathered by the experts, that's us, educators, NEU members, about how assessment can be done robustly, fairly, more equitably and differently to the status quo. If we're to create the alternative, we have to be able to articulate what that might look like, build a consensus for it and win it. And this report is the next step in giving us the tools to be able to achieve that. And it's really amazing that it's come about as a result of a motion that Vicky Fawcett from Durham submitted to annual conference in 2022. <clears throat> imagining, a imagining a better world, creating the alternative, and working alongside like-minded people like you in this room to make it a reality 
is for me what being in the union is all about. I became a teacher because I wanted to change the world and it's through the union that I believe we'll be able to do that. When I asked you to vote for me at the beginning of 2022, I said that I wanted to become vice president of the NEU to put our union at the forefront of campaigning, organizing, and winning a better education system with equality and social justice at its heart. And I'm proud to have been elected as your president based on the principles and values that I stand for. These are our core trade union values of equality, fairness, justice, and dignity for all people. We believe in solidarity, that people can achieve more acting together than they can do on their own. We understand that at times some of us need help while we all learn and are strengthened through the solidarity that we show one another. And at the heart of that is our international solidarity. I'm proud to belong to a union that has international solidarity at its core. And when we talk about solidarity, we know that it must be an action we undertake and not just a noun. I spoke on behalf of the NEU at the first major demonstration in solidarity with Palestine back in October. I said that as an education union, when we talk about the rights of all children to an education, that doesn't stop at our borders. And we must continue to advocate for the right of all children and young people, teachers and educators, to a life free from violence, war and oppression. Of course, as a union, we condemn the actions of Hamas on October the 7th. And I'm also proud that we've added our name to the many around the world including the United Nations and our Foreign Secretary who are calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. I want to pay tribute to the many NEU members up and down the country who have been taking part in peaceful protests week after week, making our voices heard, standing in solidarity with the Palestinians and calling for a ceasefire. I also want to thank and pay tribute to Louise Regan, who has led so much of the international work we do as a union, as well as to Kiri Tunks and Philippa Harvey. Their tireless and relentless campaigning on so many issues is inspirational, and I count myself as extremely fortunate to be active in the trade union movement at the same time as these three women and count them as sisters and friends. I'm proud that as a union, we also stand in solidarity with refugees, both in a practical way and advocating for safe passage for refugees and an end to the hostile environment. Many of you will remember the last time we were in Bournemouth when we raised £5,000 for Care for Calais and wore T-shirts that declared, say it loud, say it clear, refugees are welcome here. After my first Solidarity delegation in 2018, I wrote these words. Just home from an incredible weekend in Calais, volunteering with Care for Calais. I've met refugees who had to leave their homes and have walked for two months to get to Calais. People who are graduates in their home countries and desperate to work. People who are fluent in five languages. People who have seen their loved ones and friends killed people who don't know where their families are, people who have suffered the brutality of the French police and had their possessions and tents taken away from them and their phones smashed up. And I'm angry. I'm angry that as a country, we've turned a blind eye to this desperate situation taking place just over 30 miles from our border. I'm angry that our government support and sponsor the French police in creating the hostile environment in the hope that the refugees will go elsewhere and be someone else's problem. I'm angry that people who, in their own words, just want a home, safety, and the chance of education or to work, 
exactly the same things that any of us would want for ourselves and our children are being denied these. I'm angry at the government and Amber Rudd for not keeping to the promises that they made under the Dubs Amendment to let refugee children in. If I was writing this today, I'd have added that I was angry at Suella Braverman for her divisive rhetoric, demonising and whipping up hatred of refugees, encouraging and empowering the far right from the heart of government. But in 2018, I also wrote that I've met and spent time with some incredible people who give me hope that things won't always be this way. Many of us in this room, and many more that aren't here, are those incredible people. And I want to pay tribute especially to Sally Kincaid and Sarah Tomlinson for all the work they did to lead for all the work they did to lead on the refugee solidarity work within the NEU and who inspired me to organise delegations to Calais from my own district and also to Robin Tia, who has done so much to enable, encourage and inspire so many of our members to volunteer in Calais. The hope that together we can create a better world is what keeps me going. As the poet Selina Godden wrote, Hope is energy, hope is a group project, and we have work to do. That work takes time. It's a work that sometimes makes me wonder if we're making any progress at all, but it's a work that doesn't and mustn't end. I was really privileged to spend the weekend in Cardiff recently for the Wales International Women's Day weekend. While there, I was reflecting with one of the women present about how it can often feel like what we're doing, especially as women, isn't enough. When we look around at the world we're living in and how much there is to change, how can we ever do enough to make a difference? But as we sat making our Marla Peace bracelets, talking and sharing as we threaded the beads on, one by one, slowly thinking about the meaning of each one, that seemed to sum up how we get there. Bead by bead, step by step, action by action is how we build the movement. No act is too small or should be diminished if it brings us together, strengthens the collective, brings us closer to the kind of world we want to live in. While we sing together, we will never lose. As president of the NEU, I'm immensely honoured and always aware that I stand on the shoulders of giants when I think especially about the women who have led the way for me to follow. But I'm also conscious that I stand amongst giants, brilliant people, passionate and committed activists who share my ambition to change the world. Many of you will be aware that I had an incredibly difficult start to my presidential year, losing my dad in May and my mum at the end of August. The two people from my world who knew me best, loved me unconditionally and cared for me most. And I don't think I'll ever be the same person I once was. Yet, the love, warmth, solidarity and support I've received from so many of you in this room and beyond has kept me walking and I wanted to thank you all for that. I'll always be incredibly grateful to you. The only person who has always been on that path with me since day one is my sister Donna. To have a sister like mine is to know that whatever happens, you've got someone by your side to laugh with, cry with, and help you hold the pieces together. Don, never ever forget that I've got you and you've got me. I'm not gonna sing the rest of the line, you might know the song though. <laughs> and before I finish, 
I want to say thank you to the two most important people in my world to me, and that's my children, Thea and Oscar. Being your mum is the role that gives me the greatest joy in life, and you both make me so proud every day. The support that you give me from encouraging me to chair a fringe meeting the year after I first spoke, even when it meant missing the crash end of conference show, to coming to numerous meetings with me, sharing my world and understanding what it is that motivates me means everything to me. I hope you know that you're at the heart of everything that I do and I love you. Conference, I always say that I'm not president for me, I'm president for us. And when I look around the room, I see people that I've stood on a picket line with, marched together on demonstrations, campaigned against injustice, imagined a better world, got angry, laughed and cried with. When the question is asked, which side are you on? I always want my answer to be on the side of justice, of solidarity of hope on your side, on our side. Earlier, I shared with you one of the lines from the Sky Blue song, and I want to finish with the last two lines. In the original song, they go Tottenham or Chelsea, United or anyone. They shan't defeat us, we'll fight till the game is won. Well, conference, I'm changing those lines for us as we head into three and a half days of debates focusing on how we can build a union that can win. So, Sunak or Keegan, Suella or anyone, you shan't defeat us, we'll fight on until we've won. Conference, let's do this. Yeah.